Critias, the story of Atlantis. It's it's essential. It's required reading if you're going to be a student of the early uh, book of Genesis. Welcome back, everyone, to Mind Matters. I'm Harrison Cayley, joined by Adam Daniels. And today we are pleased to have back with us Russell Gimirkin to talk about his newest and third book on the history and origins of the Old Testament. This is Plato's Timaeus and the Biblical Creation Accounts, Cosmic Monotheism and Terrestrial Polytheism in the Primordial History. This book just came out a about a month ago, a bit over a month ago, um, this year, brand new, we brief we briefly alluded to and and uh, previewed this book on our last interview. Russell um, was very excited about it, and as I wrote on Facebook, my expectations were exceeded. And no, I didn't have low expectations. <laughs> I had high expectations, oh. and they were great. Each book—it's interesting because each book, um, each book has a different flavor to it. I don't know how quite to describe it. Uh, like, um, I mean, the the first book, Barosis, and in, in Genesis, uh, Manitho in Exodus, and then the second book, uh, Plato and uh, Plato and the creation of the Hebrew Bible. Hebrew Bible. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, going off memory here, and uh, well, each one, I mean, each one just has a different flavor for it. I think um, um, is that is that intentional, or is that just a a um, an artifact of the subject matter that you're pursuing, or am I or am I, I wrong to see this? I think it's mostly mostly the subject matter, but I think my approach maybe maybe get a little bit more rigorous each time. Mm-hmm. And and a little narrower, um, so I was able to sustain an argument a little bit uh, uh, better in the later ones. Also, this last one, I had some wonderful peer reviewers from uh, Rutledge who um, offered critiques of my initial final draft. Um, and so I revised my book for a whole year, especially for the last chapter, and, and it really improved it a lot. So mm. maybe I should just give credit to them. <laughs> well, it works. Um, Jaco Gorex, especially from South Africa. Oh, great. The um, the way I see it, it's almost like um, it, it's it's almost like a very contained article, like a short article, but it's just a very long version of a, of a, of a short article. So, I mean, just to give a bit of, a bit of a summary and background, you are arguing that, um, one of the most important and primary sources for the, for the, the primordial history. So primarily, primarily Genesis in a lot of the argument, but also, um, also further on there's bits in Exodus and further is, uh, the writings of Plato. Of course, in your last book, you showed that the, um, that Plato's laws were used as a source for, um, for much of the, much of the Pentateuch and specifically the laws in the Pentateuch. And so this one, you're looking primarily at Timaeus and Critias, uh, two of Plato's most famous works, um, for, for all of, history essentially so th- those works were popular back in the day um when mm-hmm. the, the the old testament was written and they're still two of his most popular works you know along with the the republic of course um and along the way just to, as an example so if we look at you know chapter chapter 3 genesis 1 and greek cosmogenes and you go through like all of the all of the greek philosophical cosmogenies so you've got Thales and Aximander and Aximenes, Xenophanes, all the way up to Plato. And then, so it's, as you say, it is quite rigorous where this, and this is one of the things I love about your work is that when you, when you go into something, you, you, you go full hog, you, you go into it. So in the, in the, in the, in your previous book on Plato's, on uh, Plato's laws and the laws of the old Testament, you, you read all of the sources for, for laws in the ancient world of the time. So all of the Greek laws, all the sources for Greek laws, all the sources for Greek constitutions, all of the ancient Near Eastern laws. So um, you, you really do a service. Yeah. yeah, And all your books. Um, What was your, 
I mean, I kind of, you know, well, people can can guess from what I just said, but what was your process for for this work? Which sources did you tend to drill into to to make sure you covered all your bases? Um, well, I did I did cover all of the Greek uh, cosmogonies by the natural philosophers. Um, one of the reasons why I surveyed everybody was, you know, my audience is, I guess, biblical scholars in a way, and they don't know about the Greek world and they don't know about Greek philosophy. So I thought it necessary to give my readers enough of an education and background so that they'd be able to judge my thesis. But um, I drilled most deeply into Plato's Timaeus, of course, um, because it, that book had a profound effect on uh, Genesis 1 through 11 and even later portions of Genesis, and the Pentateuch. Um, that was my initial impetus, Plato's Timaeus, because uh, my colleague, uh, Philippe Wadenboom from, uh, you know, a Belgian scholar, um, he had suggested that Timaeus had been used by the authors of Genesis 1. Um, so I, it was pursuing his initial kind of limited research that really made me drill into that. Um, and I found that Plato's Timaeus, which is an account of the origin of the universe, um, was it under it underlies both Genesis one, the creation story of of the whole cosmos, and also Genesis two through three, um, the story of the Garden of Eden. Um, both of them come from Timaeus. So, but when I was reading um, or working with Genesis one. I found that uh, Genesis 1 verse 2, you know, the earth was without form and void and darkness is on the face of the deep. It didn't quite 100% fit with Plato. So I also really drilled into Zeno, uh, the Stoic, and found that uh, there was a secondary influence uh, from that author. Um, and there's also influence from other uh, Greek philosophers as well, um, Pedicles and others. So these authors of Genesis, they were very well read. You know, uh, they weren't just uh, local Jews or Samaritans who were immersed in their own culture and you know expressing oral oral traditions or things like that. They they were very well read in the Greek sources, um, and specifically in philosophy. They read Plato extensively, and now we find that they read uh, the other natural Greek philosophers as well. And these philosophically inclined uh, Jewish or Samaritan authors, uh, they were directly involved in writing Genesis 1, so that's really a, a philosophical treatise almost, which is, which is kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. You also, um, just like with, uh, with the laws, when you looked at ancient Near Eastern laws, you looked at, um, ancient Near Eastern cosmogenies as well. And, uh, the, 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 the types of narratives and accounts that were present, you know, in the region at the times when most people think the Bible was written and, so you go through all the different types of um, cosmologies and cosmogenies, and so, you, so for example, what you find with the um, with the ancient Near Eastern ones is that they're primarily mythical in nature, and then you and you only really you only really find the scientific ones once you get to to the Greeks, and you only really find the mythical scientific theological. I think that's the I think that's the way you, you put yeah. it in one source. Uh -huh. Which happens to be Plato, yeah. and and the Old yeah. Testament, <laughs> so it's it, right. it's quite remarkable that um, oh well. So I all, so all, I went all, from yeah, a broad comparative approach where I compared Genesis one with with all the creation myth genres of the ancient Near East and also the Greek world, and found that it just doesn't match up. It doesn't have these 
story but God with these fantastical events, you know, Marduk defeating Tiamat and uh, splitting her body to create the heavens and the earth. And, you know, it doesn't have any of that. Um, so that brought me to the scientific. Uh, and then going through all of those, uh, just comparatively speaking, uh, there's a definite scientific content in Genesis 1. But you also have the creator uh, as a mythological character. You know, he he actually fashions the star, uh, the sun and moon, and puts them in the sky. Uh, the gods have dialogues with, uh, let us make men in our image, men and women. So there's some mythological elements. And also there's lots of theology. You know, the whole universe is good. And I go into it a bit. So those three elements that I identify just from a broad comparative approach, it drills down to just one text, the Timaeus, had those three elements. Uh, and that justified my transition from a broad comparative approach to source criticism, uh, you know, com comparing uh, early Genesis with just just Plato, just the domain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was rather pleased the way that turned out when uh, all the pieces fell together. And, uh, uh, you know, I already knew that Timaeus was sufficient, you know, mathematically speaking, but then it turns out to be both necessary and sufficient. You know, it's the one and only text that explains all those elements in Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. So it made for a nice rigorous case, I thought. Yeah, it's quite remarkable. And that's that's the case with that I find with all your books. And the it the, it only gets better, you know, with each book because you, you find these things where where everything fits together. And I've talked to a few people who have who have read your books, and, and it's the same for all of all of them. Um maybe I just have really cool friends, but um but that that when Probably. you Yeah <laughs> is that all of these uh, seemingly disparate facts or anomalies finally all come together into a a coherent picture, and so for this book, you're already you're already two books into your thesis that the the Old Testament was a Hellenistic book um, written a, approximately 270 BC, and so then okay, you go into your third book with this with this idea from Wadenboom. Um, that okay, so Timaeus, it looks like Timaeus was was written, but his 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 analysis wasn't really rigorous. It was kind of like, oh, here's some here's the here's Timaeus, here's some Old Testament yeah. stuff, and here and they kind of look the same, right? And so you go, okay, well, okay, maybe maybe Timaeus was was a source, and then as you say, the the further the further you get into it, the more the 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 better the evidence that you find, to the point where where yeah. you can you can yeah. even look and see, okay, here's the the elements in Timaeus. And you can list them in like in chronological order as the as they appear in the text, and then you look at those same mm -hmm. elements, and the the correlation is almost almost exact with what you find in Genesis. Yeah. Of course, you might have one that's a, a bit out of place, you know, here and there, but you know that's that's natural. You're not going to just slavishly copy a, a source, but you also find um, along those lines. Oh, uh, where did it go? Um, in that in that chronology. Oh yeah, yeah. So, um, so there are certain things that happen in Timaeus that are presented in a linear fashion. So, you know, let's say section A, section B, section C, but those aren't necessarily uh -huh. in chronological order. So, no. So, so you've got, you know, I think I can't remember which creation account it was. You've got like the the philosophical account, and then the um, uh -huh. like the the more mythic account, but or the creation of of humans, right? So something like that, but. So they're presented in a different yeah. order in Plato, and then in the Bible they they're presented in the same order, but but uh, the but they basically the biblical authors mess messed up the chronology. If I'm rem remembering correctly, I didn't take I didn't take notes. It just came to mind. But uh, do, do you know what I'm referring to? Um, which which phenomenon? Yes. Was? Well, in Timaeus, Timaeus, his first approach to the subject was highly highly philosophical, uh, and. Uh, Plato, through the figure of uh, Timaeus, who was uh, 
a philosopher and astronomer from Italy, from Locris, I think. Um, he said that the universe uh, is perfect and uh, orderly, and it must have been created by um, a deity who is also perfect and good. And so there was um, a philosophical deductive process uh, whereby Plato hypothesized the nature of the creator as this wonderful being who brought order to the universe. And, uh, you know, and then he lays out, he creates everything in order. And uh, like in Genesis, um, he creates um, the birds in the sky and the fishes in the sea and the creeping things on land. And, uh, you know, he goes through all of it, um, how he places the, the celestial objects in the sky and makes the universe rotate so there's day and night and all of that. He, he goes through this whole account of the perfect universe that was created. Um, and that's his first attack. That's his first approach. Uh, then in part two, he, um, yeah, in part two, he says that, yeah, but really this creator didn't actually create all those life forms. He created the stars, which he considered to be um, eternal heavenly beings, but mortal life, that was uh, potentially wicked, you know, human. Um, he, Plato could not have his perfect God create anything less than perfect, anything uh, less than immortal, um, and anything not intrinsically good. So Plato had this philosophical problem, which he solved by... Um, Acknowledging that the Greek gods, you know, uh, Zeus and all the rest, sure, they existed. Uh, and we'll make them create human life and the mortal life forms. And they're the sons and daughters of the eternal creator who created the cosmos. But in the second account, he had his sons and daughters uh, create all the mortal life forms put an eternal soul in humans and fasten their bodies and all of that. Um, and then he really took a, a third approach. And he, um, I forget the order. It might have come in the middle. It might have been last. When he talked about the material universe, because um, the creator, as an artist, uh, he had to have a perfect model with which, with, which to work. And that was himself because he was perfect. So he created the universe in his own image. Um, but he also had to have raw materials to work with. So Plato postulated that, uh, like the other Greek philosophers, that the, uh, the material universe was uh, a chaotic mass to begin with, and that these raw disordered materials are what the uh, creator fashioned uh, the world with. So that was kind of a third approach where he kind of went into the physics of things. And, uh, and that's the author of Genesis took the uh, kind of the philosophical premise of Timaeus uh, and put that into the first verse. And then the second verse talked about this chaos that uh, the creator had to work with. And then uh, then it went into the seven days of creation, which was basically Plato's initial philosophical account. So he tied it all together in chronological order, made a nice um, orderly story. And uh, he didn't use the uh, philosophical reasoning or high level of uh, discourse the Timaeus, Timaeus had. Yeah, they just made it an authoritative uh, story mm -hmm. for the citizens and children and regular people to believe. You know, just accept it. This perfect creator made a perfect universe in six days. And uh, we say so. 
And uh, it's in this holy inspired book, and therefore it's true, believe it, and, uh, um, and perpetuate it to the generations forthwith. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, well, that's, that's kind of what happened. So that kind of, uh, that kind of gets to something that you brought up, Harrison, uh, in your recent article, um, talking about, uh, belief systems. Mm. And, uh, you said that it was a, a novel belief system. It was the first belief system. Um, so I was curious about that too. Like what exactly, uh, did you mean by that? Uh, yeah. What differentiates, um, the, the system that was created as a result of all this, we're, we'll get into some of the, the process and how things developed, like in the rest of the Pentateuch too. But, but there are a couple points in the book where you, where you describe the, 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 the system that resulted from, from this as the first belief system. So there was like something new about this that didn't jive with the, with the religions that came before. So yeah. Could you get into a bit more detail on how you see that? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, Plato, um, Plato gave a lot of attention to education, to beliefs, uh, and knowledge. You know, we all start out just in the sensate world where we see images and that's very primitive. And then we, then we develop these, uh, hypotheses or beliefs about the world. And then if you're lucky, if you're a philosopher, you can uh, start to verify some of your hypotheses and prove them and raise them to the level of knowledge. So beliefs, according to Plato, were uh, a very kind of primitive form of mental existence that everyone was involved in. It's like the beginnings of intelligence. And he had a very developed educational system where the philosophers were the elites who understood the divine world, they understood knowledge, they understood science, logic. They they were they were like gods, they were almost demigods. Um, and they had the unique possession of true knowledge. Um, Plato, who was one of these philosophers, uh, he he decided that philosophers were the only people qualified to rule government. You know, they should be in charge because they're the experts. By coincidence, you know, he was the foremost philosopher. Yeah, what can you um, <clears throat> Gosh darn. But what to do with all these people that you are that you are ruling? Um, you know, he set up a theocracy, um, basically in both Republic and especially in Plato's Laws, where these uh, divinely inspired philosophers would uh, would rule society in in the God's name. Um, but the ordinary citizens, they weren't up to his level. So he had a system where he, uh, where these philosophers would induce or create uh, beliefs in the citizenry, uh, specifically that the laws came from God in ancient times and they should always be obeyed and the gods were good and uh, their role was to be obedient and uh, you know, fight in the citizen army as needed and, and comply and, uh, and uh, be pious and uh, stay in line, basically. It was, uh, so we had this universal propaganda, basically, that it was a cradle to grave educational system that uh, where he used Greek myths you know, properly censored to induce proper beliefs in the populace uh, so that they'd be compliant. And then a few rare people with the mental agility and prowess, they would be uh, admitted into the university, trained to into uh, philosophy and become the next generation's rulers. Um, so that's how he 
organized um, society and uh, and the Republicans, especially in laws. He lays it out very clearly. Um, <clears throat> so in support of this, uh, these beliefs, he proposed in laws and a bit in Republic that, uh, <clears throat> that there be created a national literature of uh, approved text that the censors, the uh, legislators of the arts would approve that would be consistent with uh, God and philosophy and the ethics of the ruling class and that uh, the populace would only be uh, allowed to have access to just that set of sacred books that were up to his holy standards, as it were. Um, you know, he, he basically invade, invented the idea of a Bible, a national literature of sacred texts. And this was for the education of the populace. So um, it, it, used, it used myths which were appropriate for inducing belief you know, in the young and also in, uh, you know, all Greeks had their myths. So uh, this whole system of beliefs for the, for the general populace was to be uh, embodied in this na national literature. But the really, uh, the ruling power of the state was a university of philosophers. Um, you know, ex-priests, ex, you know, theologians, um, and they had the real power. Um, but when this was created among the Jews, when they fashioned that form of government around 270 BC, they created the Bible. They had their set of holy books. Uh, but the philosophers who were into science and knowledge and astronomy and all the highest mental intellectual levels. Um, they were cut off at the knees. They, uh, uh, once they had their government set up, they decided we don't need the philosophers anymore. So you had all these beliefs, this belief system in this national literature that was used to program the whole populace of the nation from then into eternity, um, that persisted, but the philosophy didn't. And so unmoored from philosophy, you had a pure belief system. And it was the, it was the first belief system on earth, really. Uh, Greek religions, they didn't come with a lot of beliefs as baggage. You know, they had their, uh, religious rites and calendars, but they didn't have a, a giant belief system. But uh, in the system that Plato created, uh, the literature that guided the nation uh, would induct everybody into a set of beliefs that were compatible with the gods. So they were basically religious. And uh, that survived and the philosophy didn't. And that's what created the world's first belief system. Mm. And the first, uh, what's the, uh, what Islam would re would later call uh, a people of the book. Yeah. The, the Jews were a people of the book. The Christians were. And then uh, <clears throat> with the Quran, uh, <coughs> Islam was also. Mm -hmm. So you had the first, uh, ignoring that, the, the the Far East, which had their own literatures. But in the Mediterranean world, it was the first belief system based in a literature. Hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And I, I can't remember if it was in your book, or I'm also reading a book on ancient civilizations right now, um, but I can't remember where I, where I was reading it. It might it might have been your book about the nature of, of Greek religion, but also religion in general at the time, and how... A lot of it was, like you said, it was mostly you. You could you could mostly center it on um, 
ritual. Yeah, no, it was your book. So you've got the rituals and the rites, basically, and then you had the responsibilities of the priests and the priests, I mean, their responsibilities weren't to give like sermons on Sunday, like you, like in churches today, it's like they had very, you know, a very limited, you know, very limited role and they, they performed their function. But yeah, like you said, it wasn't a belief system in the way that, that we've been, that we're so used to from, you know, 2,300 years. Yeah, okay. and we we think that's normal. We think that's what the religion is. But it, um, I don't know if you'd call it an aberration, but it's certainly an innovation. Yeah. Uh, this whole thing of indoctrinating people in the belief system, you know, from childhood on, uh, having a religious literature and centering your 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 life around that, and having the ethics coming out of the religion, all of that. You know, we look at that as that's just that's normal religion, but uh, that was something new, and and really it all traces back to Plato, like so much, uh, like so much does. Well, th- that just made me think that. Uh, um, well, I'll ask you what you thought, what you think about this. Um, maybe given your family history too, um, w- would you maybe consider like Marxism Leninism a, a, a better or a a closer. Uh, a closer exemplar of that than modern religion, because I mean, modern religion isn't, isn't theocratic to the extent that, you know, Plato wanted it to be, or that it was in the first, uh, like Jewish society. Well, just, just wait, a, just wait a couple of years. Uh, have some, just wait <laughs> a couple of years. We'll have a full theocracy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, in America. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. But Marxism, Leninism, they did a good yeah. job because they, they had their, their national yeah. literature. Right. They had the, uh, the, the, I mean, from cradle to grave, here are the belief systems and, and here are the rules and uh-huh. the, the ruling party uh-huh. or like the priests. And, uh, uh, it just makes me think of, of Plato as kind of the, the first totalitarian, which is, which is kind of weird. Cause well, when I, when I was reading the book, there's a lot of times where I'm reading, um, you know, your presentation or Plato in his own words. And I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's cool. And then, then he'll say something else and propose something else where I'm just like, oh, you know, that's, it sounds kind of crazy. And it's this mix of, of things that sound really reasonable and, and like good ideas with other things that are just like, okay, I, I, I don't see why he yeah, has to take yeah. it in that direction. Well, the gods are all, the gods are all good. That's one thing that Plato said. There's the divine ethics, yeah. uh, you know, gods, are universally good. That's all they do. Of course, every once in a while, they have to uh, purge uh, humanity or kill off all the citizens who don't believe in their uh, system of government. Um, but that's good. That's for that's for our own benefit. So that's mm. the sort of a twisted logic that he uh, was involved with, because you know he he knew what was good, and so. He was going to enforce it on everybody. Mm-hmm. And uh, for instance, if you don't didn't believe in the gods and in Plato's laws, uh, you were incarcerated for four years, uh, and they would they would uh, have you in their re-education camp, um, and they would for four years they drill you with all the reasons why God existed. And if you still believed in physics, if you believed in uh, Anaxagoras and his model of uh, um, where the stars weren't gods, they were rocks up in the sky or whatever, then uh, after four years, if you uh, didn't come around, well, you'd have to be executed. But that was for the benefit of humanity because for the, for you didn't want to... Uh, you know, the thought police didn't want to have these bad ideas circulating. So, uh, um, yeah, beware of people selling ethics. Well, uh, especially when they also want power. Power yeah. and ethics are a bad, bad combination. Uh, but getting back to communism, um, an even better model is North Korea, mm. where you not only have all the communism, uh, all, you know, the same as with the Soviets or the Chinese, but it's also they also practice cultural isolationism. Mm-hmm. They're one of the most isolated societies 
uh, on Earth today for strictly propagandistic purposes. And that's very much like uh, Plato advocated. Um, and you also had the had the myths around the rulers, where um, you know, uh, <clears throat> where they they played a perfect game of golf in North Korea. The rulers did because they were semi divine golfers. Um, <clears throat> but so I really looked into that. Um, I was considering a book on the history of um, totalitarianism. Uh, Karl Popper, the philosopher of science, he had a book where he described Plato quite accurately as uh, <clears throat> as a philosopher of totalitarianism, because Plato did advocate cradle to grave control over society and citizens, and uh, you know, that's true. Um, so I looked into whether Marx or Hegel or any of the authors of communism had read Plato and modeled themselves on Plato because Plato's Republic especially advocated communism where everything was shared, including all the women, uh, <clears throat> you know, all the women would be shared, which Aristotle said, you know, you would uh, you you wouldn't know if you were uh, having sex with your sister or not, because <laughs> nobody would know who the father was of any child. But uh, um, so he did uh, advocate a, a communistic system, but I never found any evidence that any of the founders of communism uh, drew on Plato. Mm -hmm. Although in uh, in the schools, though, they seem to like Plato a lot in uh, in Moscow, according to one author I read. Hmm. Well, so but maybe, I think that could be coincidence. Yeah, and it could be could be just an example, of, one of those examples of parallel evolution or whatever it's called, or convergent evolution. Yeah. Or, you know, they yeah. just came to the same ideas. Yeah. Well, but but I had I had all, this image. Uh, all totalitarians oh, no. start to look alike. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had this image when you were talking about North Korea of uh, just like uh, Dennis Rodman is is friends with uh, is it Kim Jong Un. If if Plato were to come yeah. come back, you know Plato could be hanging around in his togas with Kim Jong Un and you know be being one of his homies. I think that would be that would be hilarious. <laughs> okay. So, but on this on the subject of you brought up um, Plato's idea of of the gods being all good and. One of the things that comes up in the last chapter where you're talking, uh, where everything kind of comes together very nicely, um, you talk about how the 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 narrative in, in Genesis, the, the picture presented of the world in the beginning of Genesis is this world of essentially uh, divine harmony, uh, because uh, I'll summarize a couple of things. So you, you, you mentioned this earlier about how um, in the in the Greek ph philosophical ideas, um, especially Plato, God couldn't have created uh, man because uh, man was mortal, and and so what you had was each of the kind of terrestrial gods creating their own tribes or ethnicities. So you so yeah. so, and yeah. this picture is reflected in the Old Testament, where Yahweh is is the terrestrial god of of the Jews of a specific people, and it, implicit and explicitly right. in various points of the Old Testament, you have mention of the other gods and their peoples. And throughout this period of the primordial history, they're all getting along, which is exactly how Plato said it should be. All the, the gods, yeah. kind of like uh, yeah. like parents, the gods can't fight in front of the kids. So uh, so you have all these gods and their peoples right. getting getting along together, and the peoples are getting along with each other. And then something changes, and it changes in Exodus. And at that point, you identify these kind of anti-Platonic um, values and well, well, first I just wanted to, to comment. I mean, you t talked about a bit of the twisted logic of of Plato in in relation to to this view of the gods as as totally good. Um, there's some problems with that, but compared to what it became in the Old Testament, it's kind of like, well, that might have been the better option if you'd stuck with the with everyone kind yeah. of getting along, right? So, can you describe yeah. how things changed in in Exodus and you know how they how they kind of uh, how they kind of cut the the philosophers off the, at the knees with the with the further narrative? Yeah, yeah. In Genesis, um, well, in the primordial 
history, you have the sons of God are very prominent. And they're running around on earth. They're marrying uh, wonderful women and having families and ruling their territories. And Yahweh is one of them. And uh, um, and they all get along together. And uh, there's, you know, other sources say there were 70 terrestrial gods, 70 sons of El in Ugaritic history or literature. So, and in the Table of Nations, you have 70 nations and, you know, they were all ruled by their various gods. And throughout Genesis, um, you never have any negative comments about any of the gods. Um, you know, the, Joseph marries a priest of uh, from Heliopolis and, uh, you know, uh, all the nations get along, all the gods are getting along together and everything's fine. But as you say, um, in Exodus to Joshua, um, you have a whole different narrative. Um, Genesis really has a fairly consistent philosophical viewpoint, although, you know, it's mostly storytelling. The real philosophy is concentrated in the first chapter, but uh, <clears throat> but it's very consistent on the divine ethics and the nations getting along together. But Exodus to Joshua is the story of the birth of the uh, nation of, of the Israelites. And um, they adopted Plato's uh, program for nation building. They took a lot of his laws. They uh, accepted his idea of a theocratic government and went along with a lot of Plato. But this thing of the gods getting along, no. There was only one God that was any good at all, and that was Yahweh, the God of the Jews and the Israelites. Um, <clears throat> Good was no longer a supreme ethic to rule the universe. Good no longer ruled the gods. Um, you know, 69 out of 70 gods were evil. Only Yahweh was good. And explicitly uh, contrary to Plato's ethics, that said, uh, they just said, the gods are not jealous. There's no strife among the gods. The gods get along, they divide the world up peacefully, and they are not jealous. And the Ten Commandments start out with, you know, Yahweh is a jealous God. You will have no other gods worship in my presence. So this monolatry, which um, was basically a religious monopoly, that's what they were after in Exodus through Joshua. They wanted complete control of, uh, of religion, and only Yahweh is to be worshipped. And there was a new standard of ethics, which was, if you worship Yahweh, you're ethical. Uh, and if you, uh, <clears throat> and that means you have to kill all the followers of other gods in, in the promised land. Genocide is part of that ethic. Um, antagonism towards all other religions was part of that ethics. So uh, ethics and monolatry, you know, eventually mon mon monotheism, um, they were equated. And you had, a, uh, instead of a divine ethics that even the gods were subject to, uh, you, ha you now have command ethics which Plato also discussed, where anything that any god says, it, that's the definition of good. So if, um, if you're a god in Moab and you say, uh, you know, we like, Mo we, we, we like Chemos, he's our god. And then if you're, uh, if you're the, in Israel and, well, Yahweh is my god, and the two gods are at war, and the two peoples are at war, then uh, all of a sudden this command ethic says that, well, the God of Yahweh, everything that he commands, including warring against Chemosh, 
Um, that's good. What is what does the people in Moab do? Are, you know, Mo, Kimos is their god. Aren't they supposed to obey? How did we get to be the bad guys all of a sudden? So, um, so it was a whole new uh, view of ethics, and it was a step down from Plato. Uh, Plato still had a few step ups to go. You know, he he had not arrived at uh, a real ethics, I think. Uh, but uh, but the Exodus through Joshua that uh, was making Yahweh worship the virtue uh, that was that was a step down. And the way they did that, the way they overcame Plato's ethics, is for the first time in uh, in the Ten Commandments and in Exodus, they equated this local God, Yahweh, as the creator of the universe, which was not the case in Genesis. But in, uh, you know, in the Sabbath commandment, especially, the creator of the universe is for the first time explicitly equated with Yahweh. And therefore, uh, <clears throat> whereas Genesis was uh, polytheistic, you know, uh, benevolent polytheism. Um, in in Exodus, you only had one good God. It was the forerunner of monotheism, and as such, um, you know the Israelites were at war with all the other gods. Mm -hmm. there, so, there's a great book that I read. Uh, I think I footnoted somewhere about God against the gods, where all monotheistic religions. Uh, wind up warring against mm -hmm. anyone of a different religion and how uh, <clears throat> monotheism leads to holy war. And uh, it's very insightful. And that was certainly the case in the biblical text. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, that seems to be another thing that, um, that followed on from the, like the anti-Platonic, um, Use of some of Plato's ideas, use and abuse of some of his ideas, but but um, but that might I'm guessing that might not have been the case if if they would have kept to to Plato's cosmic monotheism because um, you basically argue that uh, that Plato basically invented monotheism in, in a certain manner, um, you know, thought about it in a certain way um, because monotheism isn't isn't the same. As, well, it's. Uh, Plato's monotheism wasn't the same as the religious monotheisms that developed out of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, and it wasn't the same as um, uh, what's the word um, henotheism, where you have just one head honcho god like Zeus. They're all all the gods are on the same level. He's just the you know the one at the top of the hierarchy. In in Plato, you've got mm -hmm. a qualitatively different type of of monotheism going on where you have the supreme creator who is like um of a totally different nature than the than the the children of god that he created the the you know the god the storytale gods and so yeah. um so that's a, a different kind of monotheism than the ones that developed and that's and that you know that that's one of those things where i'm like oh well that sounds like a, a pretty cool idea compared to you know to compare compared to what we ended up getting um this this uh maybe things would have turned out that way or differently but um yeah but well do you have any comments on on platonic like the the cosmic yeah. monotheism of the title exactly that's why i call it cosmic monotheism um at the beginning of the universe you know actually before the universe was <laughs> ordered into the cosmos um it was monotheistic there was only one god this uh, craftsman, Plato called him the Demiurge. Uh, elsewhere, he called him Naus or Intelligence, um, who was the only god in existence at the uh, dawn of time. He lived in the eternal realm. Um, he could directly look on the world of forms, and um, he was the eternal god. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, oh, we lost your uh, we lost your sound there, Russell. It still says 
it still says your sound's on. Maybe did the microphone get unplugged or something? I'm using the camera oh. mic. Okay, there, it's back. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, it's there. I just got a little closer to the camera. Um, <clears throat> so at the dawn of time when the cosmos was being created, there was one cosmic god. So that's cosmic monotheism. And then later, after the cosmos or world is created, then all these terrestrial gods are, are generated. Um, you know, the Greek gods or... Uh, or so they're, they're, they're all located within the universe, whereas the monotheistic god is really outside the universe. So there is a qualitative difference. And he lives in the realm of the divine. Uh, the other gods, since they're gods, they're also, and since they were created by this cosmic god, they're necessarily uh, good and divine as well, intrinsically. Um, <clears throat> but so you have this benevolent polytheism on earth during the present age. Um, and Plato divided it off. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the cosmic realm was where his God existed at the dawn of time. But after he created the perfect cosmos, he was done. He rested. You know, basically he rested after six days, as they say in Genesis. Uh, um, and after that, he turned over the material world to his sons these and daughters, the uh, polytheistic gods. So that was their domain, which was separate. Um, it was separate, separate temporally, you know, the present age and the present world, whereas uh, <clears throat> Plato was concerned with the uh, divine world basically outside the universe. And that's, uh, that's where the uh, God was that the philosophers were most interested in. So he was, he was interested in studying this philosophical God, but he let, uh, he'd let the ordinary citizens have their regular gods and goddesses and holidays and rituals and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm which was useful for his purposes. Yeah. And then what we get, so so in, as you describe in the book, well, so you mentioned it earlier in the interview, how the, the story that we get in Genesis 1, the philosophical story, it's, it's basically like a... Um, like a five minute YouTube video for, for an elementary school version of it. Right. So they, they present the, okay. here's the, here's the bullet points, here's the story. And then, you know, when you get to university, we'll tell you how it all works, but, uh, but here, here's, here, here's the points that you, that you can use for the, the rest of your childhood and for, you know, just for regular, regular folks who's, who aren't, you know, um, educatable or, or, um, you know, or don't, don't have the inclination. Yeah. And, and that's part of the, yeah. part of the plan that, that you, that you got into in, um, mm. in the previous book on uh, Plato and the creation of the Hebrew Bible. As you yeah. mentioned, it's like, here's the literature that we present. This is the, this is, these are the stories that we present to the people in order to unify them, in order to get them all on the same page. And then ideally, like in a platonic model, we would have the university where we get into the details. But as you, as you said, so far in the interview, that got cut short. So the the, the way Judaism went forward from two seventy on is they, they didn't have the the university yeah. where they where they got into all that no, stuff. It was they, like they here's stuck, the book. They stuck with homeschooling. Basically, yeah. <laughs> Plato invented homeschooling. Ouch. <laughs> and uh, um, well, okay. So then that kind of gets to something that I was curious about, which was. Uh, this this divergence between um, Plato and his prescriptions, basically, uh, and his doctrines versus the what we actually got uh, with Judaism at the time was that. Would you say that you see that as being like more uh, like were they more ruthless than Plato was? Did they? Uh, I'm just trying to get into their mindset, uh, and I don't know if you would be able to to do it 
uh, either. But what was the decision? What you know? What made led them to making that decision to to cut off the the philosophers at the knees and to keep people in that kind of very uh, homeschooled environment, uh, as you so put it. <laughs> Um, well, I'm not sure that anyone was more ruthless than Plato, but they were ruthless in a different way. Um, Plato wanted his government to be, uh, his theocracy to be governed by what he called the Nocturnal Council, which was a, a university of theologians, philosophers, uh, the guardians of the law. And um, they, they studied philosophical matters, ethics, uh, astronomy, the, the, the monotheistic God. It, you know, it was their university, it was their philosophical school. Um, and then they administered the beliefs of the nation uh, and, and the government and all of that. And, uh, and that was externally implemented around 270 BC when you had the new system of government of, <coughs> of a uh, council of elders uh, known as also known as the Senate or Gerusier Sanhedrin um, led by a high priest which was an innovation and that was that was modeled externally on Plato's nocturnal council. Um, but it did not function as a Platonic university as Plato had uh, uh, designed and imagined because that's where the values of Plato and the philosophy and the theory of government was to be handed down from one generation to the next. Uh, and that, that didn't happen. Um, at the end of Plato's laws, he, he mentions how, okay, you set up this new government. You set up the divine council, the uh, nocturnal council, and you get the initial generation of uh, rulers. And then at some point, you know, and hopefully they're philosophically trained. They've been through the seminars. The, they've internalized all of this. Uh, but at some point, you just have to throw the dice and let them start ruling. You know, he said, it's a game of chance. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Maybe they'll follow Plato's, you know, my tenets. And uh, you just can't guarantee that in advance. Well, they threw the dice in Judea. And, uh, and, and like Plato said, you know, there were a lot of priests, a lot of experts in the law in this uh, Senate. And uh, they were given the reins of government. And uh, they said, uh, okay, we're in power now. We don't need Plato anymore because we have, we have the power. That's what we mm -hmm. wanted all along. Yeah, thanks, That's sucker. We've always had. And, uh, you know, but... Why, why keep going with this Plato stuff? Yeah. So, um, so philosophy was, uh, it was out. And a big reason why Plato was so insistent that uh, philosophy was going to be the salvation of the nation, you know, is actually literally going to save the nation and preserve it through time and, and make the constitution eternal was uh, you need the rulers of your government to be subject to rationality and not impulses and appetites and ambition. And uh, Plato said, and, and here his ethics were good again, you know, it's very mixed story. But he said, uh, you know, people tend to be ambitious. Uh, governments tend to want to conquer and acquire territory. 
and that makes enemies. And uh, and then you have all these enemies, and then that's it for your government, because somebody's going to conquer you at some point. That you have to live peacefully with all the other nations for your government to survive. So um, historically, um, the kingdom of Judea, um, you know, already in Numbers and Joshua, they had this outline of territorial aggression. They wanted to conquer uh, from the uh, promised land clear to the coast to areas that not even Joshua had ever conquered. And uh, they, they were expansionists by their nature. And uh, when you get down to the 100s BC, you have uh, Alexander Janaeus. He conquered Moab, he conquered along the coast, Gaza. He was, he was a big, big troublemaker. You know, he declared himself king and he was such a problem. And then they had a civil war among his sons to control uh, the government. And it was such a problem that uh, the neighboring nations appealed to Pompey, the Roman general who was campaigning in the East. And he came to Damascus to settle the dispute. And his solution was, Rome is going to take over. Judea as a nation is over. It's a clan kingdom. You know, that's it. And it really all played out exactly as Plato predicted. You get these ambitious rulers with territorial ambitions and uh, conquering raiding neighbors, stealing, being a problem. You're going to make lots of enemies, and it's going to be the downfall. So he, he got that right. And, uh, you know, nations that are always aggressing against their, their neighbors, uh, they're, that, those are the roots, the seeds of their own destruction. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were ruthless in that way. Um, not so much internally, um, although, you know, the Maccabees, they did burn a few pagan temples and stuff. But as, as a whole, the, the Jews were pretty peaceful people internally. Uh, but, uh, you know, their external wars based on this mandate in, uh, in, the, in the Hexateuch, in, uh, in Joshua especially, this uh, mandate of military aggression, uh, that's where the problems started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a well, specifically biblical form of uh, ruthlessness. Then yeah. the genocide, you know, that was a problem too. <laughs> well, um, well, uh, well, maybe if you get, do you think your voice can hold out for a, another question too, Russell? Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. If, okay. if my listeners be, can tolerate it. Uh, yeah, they'll be fine with it. Um, because we have to get into what yeah. I'm sure everyone was waiting for, and that is Giants and Atlantis. Because uh, you've revealed Absolutely. the secrets, you've solved the mysteries, and it's all in the book. <laughs> um, what I, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll give a bit of my response first on the Nephilim, so on the Giants. So so I, I had... Yeah. This was totally, this was, your take was totally new to me because, um, you, you bring it, you, you talk about the Nephilim passages and, and then, so, you know, given the, the thesis of the book, you say, okay, well, where, where can I look to try to see if, uh, where these guys came from? What, you know, what's going on behind this passage? <clears throat> and your conclusion is that the, uh, the Nephilim are like the, they are the, the the children of these uh, these intermarriages between the gods and the and the daughters of men, and so where do we find similar things like that? Well, it's in the like the the age of heroes in the, in the Greeks, right? So these were the the the, the Greek heroes, and the, so the Nephilim aren't these like in in the the sub the subtext or like the implication of the 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 passage the short passage on the nephilim in in the in genesis isn't that these were like evil watchers like in the enochian literature it's that 
these guys were actually good. They were, they were, they were really great guys. Um, but can you talk a little bit about the Nephilim, the, you know, how they relate to the Greek sources and then how this, this, um, how this idea progressed and how it changed over time to the, you know, to the point where we have this, 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 um, kind of knee jerk interpretation that the Nephilim were the guys causing all of the violence and, and causing the, the world to go awry that led to the flood. Like how, how did all this play out? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go in reverse order. Um, we'll start out with the Enoch literature. Um, well, we'll start out with Genesis 6, verse 1 through 4. You know, the sons of God uh, marry these beautiful women. Um, and the word in both Greek and Hebrew for beautiful uh, is the same as the word for good. You know, they were wonderful, beautiful women, and they were desirable, and the gods married them. And they had... Uh, the offspring, the giants, and the age of heroes, uh, which is how it's described in the Septuagint. Um, and these these were men of renown. They were mighty warriors. They were they were heroes. They were demigods. They were half god. They were half human. So, um, <clears throat> in the Enoch literature, all these good figures these positive, uh, the sons of God, the daughters of men, the giants, they were all turned into villains, all of them, because it was incompatible with, uh, with monotheism or monolatry. So the sons of God, all of a sudden, they get turned into the watchers, fallen angels who... Uh, they rebelled against heaven, wound up on earth, and uh, um, because they and they desired, they had lust for these uh, these loose women on earth, I guess, and uh, taught them all sorts of divine secrets that they shouldn't have known, <clears throat> and their offspring were uh, <clears throat> ravenous giants, you know, as tall as cedars who, uh, they were cannibals, they ate everything in sight, they were violent, they caused trouble, uh, you know, that, that's how it was in the Enoch literature, and that's really what has governed scholarship, you know, ever since, that's, that's still the view that people take today, mm-hmm. in biblical scholars, as a rule, uh, but that's what you call reception history. There's the text, and then there's how people interpret and respond to the text. That's the reception. And the Enoch literature was a very negative reception of Genesis. But in Genesis, um, they were all good. The sons of God, they were good. The daughters of men, they were good. The giants, they were all good. Um, and a lot of um, students of this passage have uh, drawn parallels to the the catalog of women, which uh, has been attributed to Hesiod, but mm-hmm. people today say Hesiod didn't really write it, but it was around that time, 700 BC. And they had all sorts of marriages between the Greek gods and different beautiful women. That was just... Uh, that was a very common theme in, uh, <clears throat> in, in Greek mythology. But, uh, but they didn't have giants in the catalog of women. And people looked at that as the example because um, they thought Genesis was pretty old and the catalog of women was really the only older Greek text. So, um, uh, but Plato's Critias, which is a story of Atlantis, uh, it also has uh, Poseidon, the god of Atlantis. He marries Pleto, who's this beautiful woman. And, uh, you know, 
And everyone agrees that Plato used the catalog of women for some of his themes. So you have the catalog of women uh, coming down to Genesis by way of Plato's Critias. And um, so they have 10 offspring, five twins, five pairs of twins. And the foremost was uh, <clears throat> Atlantis, uh, Atlas, excuse me. He was the firstborn son, uh, after whom Atlantis was named, as well as, you know, the Atlas Mountains and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and, it, you know, in later traditions, he was a giant. So really, uh, Plato's Critias is the only example where you have gods marrying uh, uh, women and having giants as offspring. Although Hercules, he was about, he was seven or eight feet tall. So really, if you're a son of a god, except if you're Alexander, he was pretty short. But the rest of them, in legendary times, they were semi-gigantic. Um, but in Plato's Critias, you also have this happening. Um, the son of the god Poseidon, they were wonderful, perfect, noble rulers um, initially. But then the second generation, they weren't half gods, they were one quarter gods, you know, because they married other human women. And then one eighth and one sixteenth, and then one in one thousand and twenty four after uh, I forget how many powers of two that is. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, so they virtually became human eventually. And Plato wrote that became a problem because then they became lawless and aggressive and uh, you know wanted to acquire more territory and invaded the Mediterranean and tried to enslave other countries like uh, Plato thought was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, Zeus, who was the chief of the terrestrial gods, he determined, you know, for their own benefit, since I'm such a wonderful god, I'm going to have to drown them all. You know, we're going to sink Atlantis, earthquakes, floods, uh, uh, you know, wipe them all out and get a fresh start for their benefit. You know, they need a reboot. Uh, <clears throat> it's like uh, it's like the world was a computer. It was infected by a virus, and they had to start out with a new operating system or something. Like, I don't know what is so um, earthquake, rain. Flood, Atlantis is sunk. Even the righteous Athenians, they were wiped out except for a few that fled to the mountaintops. And this is, uh, so you have a flood story, uh, the flood story of Atlantis, um, <clears throat> which is very much like Genesis. And other than Genesis is the only flood story in antiquity, uh, there was a morality play you know, where it was the wickedness of people that caused the gods to send a flood on the earth. Because mm. Plato, he loved to moralize. I mean, he loved to have uh, myths that uh, myths or stories that carried an ethical uh, message. Mm -hmm. um, so, like Disney. Yeah, the um, Critias, the story of Atlantis. It's it's essential. It's required reading if you're going to be a student of the early uh, book of Genesis. Yeah. yeah, all biblical scholars now must become Atlantis scholars as well. Mm -hmm. That means they they also have they to must. read all of the fringe books on Atlantis. They have to make sure they have all their facts straight. Absolutely. Yep, um, it'll be a new <laughs> de devote a new shelf in every biblical scholars library exclusively to. Atlantis books. The the Atlantean Department of yeah. uh, Scholar or Department of Atlantis Studies. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, we don't like. Uh, <clears throat> we only like Atlantis. We don't like Lemuria or the continent of Mu. 
um, those are bad continents. Right. We only yes. like our good continents. Yes, yes, Atlantis. <laughs> Is there, um, there's also another connection to Atlantis too, in the Garden of Eden. Is that correct? So yes. you've actually solved the mystery of the location um, of Atlantis. It is in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Okay, uh, good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, the the Garden of Eden with its uh, the paradise of garden of trees and streams and uh, all sorts of animals, gods living together with humans. Um, you don't find that anywhere in the ancient Near Eastern literature. It just doesn't exist. And uh, you do have a few stories about gods living with humans at the very dawn of time in Greek myths. But really, uh, <clears throat> Plato's Critias is the only one that has this big, full description of Atlantis as having streams and gardens and every form of animal and Poseidon living with his wife and children and humans. And it was, it was a paradise and uh, it was a direct forerunner of the description in Genesis too. So uh, there's another uh, good reason to read on Atlantis. Yes. All right. Well, I think we'll end it there, Russell. Thank you so much. Um, it's it's been a pleasure. the The book again is Plato's Timaeus and the Biblical Creation Accounts. We'll put up a link to some of the places you can get it. Um, probably the most the most affordable at the moment is the Kindle edition. Do you know if they're planning on putting out a paperback edition eventually, Russell? Or? Well, initially, initially they uh, kind of projected that they might, but okay. that never materialized that I've seen. Okay. I think it would be wonderful. Yeah. And I'm going to try and convince marketing. Yeah. Um, but uh, we'll see. Okay. Well, either way, until, until well, as a, uh, I think everyone should buy it now as uh, to, to let the publisher know that, oh, well, maybe if we publish a soft cover, then it will, uh, you know, maybe it's worth co publishing a soft cover, but everyone needs to buy it first. Um, even on even on a Kindle, um, it's a great book, and um, yeah, if you haven't read his other books too, I think you, you can start with this one. You don't need to read your other books first um, because you give enough background in here, you know, on everything else. So um, if this one sounds interesting, but you know, you think that you might have to read the other ones first, you don't have to. You can read them in reverse order. All right. Well, thanks again, Russell. We'll. Uh, yeah, we'll put links to your website as well. You've got a website where you've got uh, links to all of your other interviews yeah. and your list of your papers, list of your books. So uh, we'll direct people your way. Thanks again. And we'll talk again sometime yeah. in the future. All right. Well, always a pleasure. Okay. Thanks, Russell. Take care. Mm -hmm. You too. Bye.